Hello and welcome again to Mid American Gardener. I'm your host and Master Gardener intern, Tanisha Shade Spain. This week we have a lot of show and tells to show you and we're gonna answer some of your questions. But first, let's go ahead and introduce some of our panelists who will be answering those questions for you today. And we'll start down here with you, Rusty. Hi, thank you. Uh, so my name is Rusty Malding. Uh, I am a partner and horticulturist for Nature's View. Uh, it's, it's a landscape professional firm out of uh, Watsika, Illinois. I'm also the past president of the Illinois Landscape Contractors Association. All right, wonderful. Phil? I'm Phil Nixon. I'm an extension entomologist with the University of Illinois. Entomology is a study of insects, so I handle bugs and spiders and things related to bugs. All the creepy crawlies. All the creepy crawlies. <laughs> All right, and Dyke? Hello, my name is Dyke Barkley. I teach uh, the horticulture program down at Lakeland College in Mattoon. And my specialty is probably perennials and grasses and unusual plants. Okay, wonderful. All right, so Rusty, we're going to jump in with you. You've got a show and tell item that you're going to talk about with us. Sure, absolutely. So um, most every gardener has, uh, has at least a, a, a bitty patch of turf, and some have a very large expanse of turf. And so one of the things that often gets overlooked are your, your mowing blades, um, those things that, uh, you know, cut the grass. Um, it seems like to me, most people take care of their engines pretty well, but the blades are sort of the second thought. So I brought with me today some samples of things of maybe different, different, um, different things, I guess. Um, this is an excellent reason why you need to maintain <laughs> your mowing blades. Uh, this cutting surface is dull. It's going to tear and rip your turf. Um, the blade itself is actually bent. It's going to do bad things for your deck, uh, your spindles. So in general, this is junk. <laughs> so if your blade, blade looks like this, get rid of it. Get rid of it. And then you've got some options. So in the fall, um, I like to look at something like this that has a fin on the back side that will actually chop leaves as, you're, as it turns. Um, it's a great thing to kind of, uh, it's, a, it's a mulching blade mm -hmm. of sorts, uh, a gator blade. And uh, this goes on a, on a bigger deck, but uh, in general, this is a fantastic way to deal with your leaf problems in the fall. You mow it over two or three times, and this, these fins in the back, this shred the leaves to bits. They drop down into the turf, and um, it's a great way to get rid of those leaves and leave them where, they're, where they can benefit your turf. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, another type of blade is this, this is an actual mulching blade. Um, and some smaller mowers, you'll see some of these different configurations, but the end cuts and the top piece up here, it, um, it does a nice job of mulching. And this, this really is a true mulching blade, and, and this will absolutely atomize your, your, le your uh, fall leaves. Interesting. Um, something else that you might want to think about is sharpening your blades. So let's just say that uh, you have a blade that doesn't look like the first one I showed you, but it's a little dinged up. You want a nice, sharp, edge. Um, we, we sharpen our blades about every 20 to 30 hours of, of run time. So for some homeowners it may be once a year, um, some homeowner, homeowners maybe once a month. It just depends on how often you use it. Uh, and then you get a nice sharp uh, edge on this and it'll do a great thing. Keeps your grass being cut uh, nice and tight um, and uh, you get clean cuts on the blade and it's good for the health of your turf as well. So if you're, if you're not one to rake the leaves up in the fall, those are some good options. <laughs> Absolutely, and what we actually do is if, if you're in a wooded lot, we will um, we'll chop them up and then blow the leaves into beds, and it acts as a great mm -hmm. mulch then for the winter. Um, don't bag them, don't take them to a landfill, mm -hmm. don't burn them, chop them up and use them, reuse that, that uh, God-given free, uh, mulch. free mulch. Exactly. Yep. exactly, exactly. Thank you so much. Okay, and Phil, the bug guy, you, it looks like you've got uh, I've got an email from a viewer. Okay, go ahead. And some props. Uh, Robert Velez says, is milky spore a good solution for grubs and when should it be applied? Well, milky spore is a, is a disease that, uh, uh, to, that, that will attack white grubs and uh, it's served its purpose for decades, but it's kind of lost its uh, a glimmer to a certain extent. Uh, the shine has gone off of it. Uh, essentially, in the early 2000s, uh, we started noticing some problems with milky spore disease working well against white grubs. And, the, uh, and what we found out was that where we were normally getting 90 to 95% kill with milky spore disease, really got down to where we were really only getting about 
about anywhere from 11 to 20 percent control. In fact, I did some research here at, uh, at the University of Illinois <coughs> Turf Farm and found out that uh, I got 17 percent control, which is right in that range uh, of what we got. And we don't know what's happened. Uh, it, we do know that after about 30 generations, many insects will tend to become resistant to insecticides. And uh, this material has been out on the market in heavy use since uh, the late 60s, early 70s. And if you do the math to the early 2000s with a one-year life cycle insect, which is what white grubs have, gee, it's 30 generations. So it may be that we're getting some resistance associated with this. Uh, and, uh, and, the, uh, and so we just, we took it out of our, I took it, we took it out of our recommendations for the University of Illinois uh, in, the, in, in the early 2000s and have not really been recommending it since. Uh, for people who want to have a, uh, a natural or biological or non-chemical method of, of controlling uh, white grubs, uh, a more recent thing that's come on the market has been Bacillus thuringiensis gallerae. You've probably heard of Bacillus thuringiensis or BT. Really what we normally are talking about is BTK, Bacillus thuringiensis kerstaki, which is effective on insects on trees and shrubs. There's also Bacillus thuringiensis israeliensis, BTI, which is used in mosquito control for larvae. Uh, Bacillus thuringiensis gallerae is effective against white grubs, both the adults and the larvae. And so, uh, and so you, can, you can get good control there. It's sold, the only place I know in the Midwest that sells it is Gardens Alive. And so I'll unabashedly say that, uh, but uh, they're in Lawrenceburg, Indiana, and you can there's a mail order thing, there's a website, and so on. But these are these are effective materials that are effective against if you want to go that way. But to determine whether you really have a problem or not, you want to find out how many white grubs you've got. And white grubs don't get quite this big. They usually top out at about an inch long, <laughs> and they do have legs on them. This one doesn't have legs, but, you know, I'm not going to hold that against it. That would be uh, discriminatory. But at any rate, uh, the point is that they will feed on the roots of the grass and cause damage associated with that. And they're usually all hatched out by about the end of the first week of August most years. And the way that you can check is you can cut down for it and find it. This is one of the knives that I like to use for checking for white grubs. And it's a serious knife. You want to have something that's got a serious blade on it because you're cutting through the sod. You cut it through about a, a foot on each side and, and then use a knife to kind of pry it up and grab it up, pull it up and just peel it back. And the white grubs, if it's a well-watered lawn, will be right there in the area or back up in the sod that you just pulled back. You do a quick count, and if you've got 10 or 12 or more, it's enough to cause injury, and you probably need to treat to prevent damage later in the season. But it's all on, this is called scouting, and you're checking to see, to see what, uh, what is really out there and, and if you have enough to really cause injury. And there are chemical insecticides. We have some of the, some of the best insecticides we've ever had today to control uh, white grubs as well as the BT gallery that I just mentioned. So there are some options there, but it's always a good idea to check before you, before you treat to make sure you've got something you need to treat for. Now, um, in the chapter that you taught, um, you mentioned when you're going to check and you think there may be a problem, if you're seeing the spots in your yard, where do you cut? to find them. Okay, well generally what you want to do is uh, if you've got some spots or some, some brown areas, the ideal spot is the same thing you do for diseases and that's where the disease ends and the new green growth starts. And certainly on a, uh, on, a, on, a, on a brown patch in your yard, it's kind of in that edge. You probably want to look back with grubs where the, uh, where the heavy brown area is as well because that may be your highest number of grubs. Gotcha. Because grubs are different from diseases. Well, some a lot of diseases will feed on dead stuff too. Many grubs will feed on dead material, so they'll be still hanging out there feeding mm -hmm. on dead roots and, and humus in the soil and things of this nature, uh, but uh, even if they've killed off all the grass. But where you're going to find out what's really happening, where the rubber's hitting the road, so to speak, is right where, where, the, where it's looking a little peak and a little brownish mm -hmm. on the edges a little bit. That's where you They're really moving. want to check. Yeah, gotcha. don't check the greenest grass in the world. That's where there's probably the fewest grubs. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Phil. All right. And, Dyke, you brought some things to share. Yeah, I just brought a plant that, that I wanted to kind of show off here and get some maybe you thinking a little bit. Um, when you're looking in your yard, not that this is the brand new latest, and maybe that's why I kind of like it. Uh, this is a, a small woodland sunflower. Um, Helianthus microcephalus, uh, you, you occasionally run into a, a cultivar of it, Lemon Queen. But 
what I want you to think about, there seems to be a trend to get plants that are really dwarf and really small right now. And I keep thinking, you know, I'm a big guy and I'm sitting here trying to suck it up for 30 minutes on this show and, and not doing very well. <laughs> but um, uh, get some big plants. And when I say that, this guy is going to have blooms from five feet to seven feet off the ground. Wow. So this plant is bigger than me, okay? And I make every one of my students do a design. They have to pick plants that are bigger than them. So we don't need everything in the yard knee high. We need some big ones. Typical sunflower um, handles the drought. I've had this in some years where everything's burned up and this thing really is covered in blooms. It is covered in pollinators. It's covered in butterflies. It's got a lot of things going for it. Zero maintenance. Um, look at some of those. I don't think everything has to be the latest and greatest two foot tall. Back up and look at some of these that maybe 20 years ago on the market. Uh, and again, bigger than me, so I can look up at a flower instead of having to get down on my hands and knees. And you can't go wrong with that. No, you Those can't. Those are the old you can't. tried and, these, and true. And these guys have been blooming in my yard since you know early in the summer, and they're still and I, you know, they're still going all summer long, all into early fall. And where would a prairie be without six and eight foot tall big blue stem right. and Indian grass? Right. You know? There you go. Right. There you go. Okay. All right, Rusty, we're going to go back to you. All right. Well, I, I promise uh, we did not talk oh, about this. <laughs> we, we did not <laughs> talk about this ahead of time, but uh, I'm going to block you a little bit there, Phil. That's all right. It does me well. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I guess really what I wanted to talk about is planting because, you know, it's fall, right? And there, I, I occasionally get the question, can I, it's after June, can I plant still? And so um, I'm here to tell you, you can. Um, uh, there's always exceptions, like the English language, there's exception to every rule. But in general, you can certainly still plant perennials, shrubs, trees, the whole, whole shebang. And um, what you're gonna find when you go to the garden center, all right, so most, we're all conditioned, right? We go, we go to the uh, grocery store, we gotta find the reddest tomatoes. We have to find the perfect cucumber. Everything has to be blemish free. Well, when you go to the garden center in the fall, things are not blemish free. <laughs> that doesn't mean they're not healthy. Um, so what you're buying in the fall is the root system. So really what you wanna do, and I'm gonna take this over here and I'm gonna tip it up, is you're looking for a nice root system on, on the, you know, take, go ahead, take the pot off. It's just that simple. Uh, you're looking for a nice root system underneath here because in another month or two, or in the spring, whatever it may be, you're actually gonna cut these off at the ground. And so what, you know, there's some, so, so what if there are some brown leaves? So what if it's, you know, a little leggy at the bottom? Put it in the ground, next spring it's gonna come up from, um, fresh from the ground, and you'll have a brand new plant that's gonna look awesome. Uh, fall planting is actually my favorite time to plant because they require the, the least amount of watering, the least amount of care, um, it just, it works. Uh, this happens to be a Rebeccia sub subtomentosum, uh, which is, um, again, a, a, about a four foot, maybe five foot tall perennial. Has the yellow flower starting at the end of July and it flowers for about a month to six weeks. Um, it's a great partner plant with some of those uh, plants that uh, Dyke was just talking about. Um, so some of the, um, uh, some of your, your grasses, the panicums, I actually have it mixed in with some little uh, big blue stem and little blue stem. It does a, a great job of partnering with those two does uh, seed just a little bit, um, but it's not an aggressive seeder, at least not that I found. And uh, you know, it's, if you have it in the right setting, that can be uh, an awesome thing. So Rusty, when you said look at the root system, what are some things that you don't want to see when you take that pot off? You don't want to see decaying roots. So some plants will have nice, really bright white roots. Um, other plants are, you know, uh, this one is, they were a little bit browner. But what you kind of want to see is that it's rooted really well to the, to the edge of the pot. So you have roots clear out to the edge of the root ball. Um, and that, uh, you know, none of the roots are sloughing off. Okay. If it's been overwatered for a long time, sometimes you just kind of take your thumbnail and scrape across it and the, the outer layer of that root will just slough right off. Um, you know, if you, as long as you have a, a fair amount of green um, leaves on top, you can have some of this legginess. This is all very typical stuff. Gotcha. Um, so not, not really a problem at all. But, uh, you know, it, I can't say it enough. I think maybe another clue is a lot of people want to focus on that flower. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. And really what you should be doing is looking at the number of shoots. Mm -hmm. ah. So six shoots is better than three. Who cares if it's got flowers this late in the summer? Mm -hmm. Look at the number of shoots because that's theoretically going to mean more shoots in the ground for next year. Right. More, more eyes, more, more mm -hmm. buds, a, a fuller plant. Just yeah, if you just comes that flower. It is because we're, we're trained, right? We you have, are. You have the scratch and dent sale at the, at, the, at the big box store, and it's like you expect to get something off. Well, 
and it's an inferior product, right? Now you're going to get a scratch and dent sale on a really awesome um, plant, and it's going to be better next mm -hmm. year. It'll perform really well for you next year, maybe yeah. not this year. There's a yard that I drive by occasionally that has their entire yard planted of these. Oh, really? There is no grass in the yard. It's And about three weeks ago, it was stunning, just all these yellow flowers all over. Yeah. It's yeah. great. Yeah, it's very awesome. cool. Different. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how they got it through the local ordinances, but they did. Hey. <laughs> all right. All right. And Phil, you've got um, something about pollinators. Yes. Uh, may have noticed that if you drive around uh, the state of Illinois, uh, particularly, uh, the uh, or drive through Illinois, that there are uh, 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 kiosks that are in the uh, in the rest areas around. Uh, they're about uh, this wide, <coughs> and uh, they're kind of squarish and about three to four feet tall. And they used to have a, a display on emerald ash borer in them, but the uh, but the emerald ash borer is pretty well widespread throughout the state, and so we were able to a couple years ago get a get a grant to switch those over to pollinators and so that's what we've done uh, 30 rest areas around the state approximately a little bit less than that have uh, this is the back uh, part of the, of the uh, display and uh, it shows on there as as the camera panned across it that it's not just bees and butterflies that are pollinators you saw beetles you saw flies in fact some would even look like wasps were flies uh, wasps and things of that nature and so uh, and so you can you can end up with uh, with this is actually a flower fly we'll get to it there we are right there and uh, and it's a uh, and it's a very important pollinator so there are lots of things that are pollinators of plants and we try to get that across to people and it all works in well with the Illinois Department of Transportation's idea associated with uh, with planting roadsides and so on. They have a very big pollinator, Save a Monarch and so on program that they're, that they're doing on their interstates around the state of Illinois. And other states are too, because, uh, because in the Obama administration, uh, states were, were given the task of doing things in each of their states to help promote pollinators and, and monarch butterflies. And that is a continuing thing that they are gearing up and doing. And we have giant models, a big yellow jacket wasp, which is also a good pollinator. It may sting you, but it pollinates a lot of plants. <laughs> and it feeds its kids uh, little caterpillars. So it's a great biological control agent. There's a beetle in there too, and as they do a lot of pollinating. So we have models and information on it. We have, uh, we have a QRC, one of those things that you kind of point at and mm -hmm. flick with your cell phone. Directs you to a website that has about 15 or 20 different fact sheets on how to grow a pollinator garden and how to grow pollinator pockets and what kind of, of insects are, are important in pollinators and a thing on honeybees and yeah, it just goes on and on. And so uh, this is something that's new out there and if you don't have one of the fancy cell phones, the URL is written right there so you can go to it. So kind of look for this in your, in your rest areas. They're, they're around the state. And uh, we're trying to educate people about pollinators and get them out of the honeybee, monarch butterfly uh, mm -hmm. thing. Those are very important as well, but they're not the only, only game out there in town. I feel like that's the new buzzword lately. I've, I've seen a lot of people talking about it. I've seen a lot of people planting little mm -hmm. pollinator pockets. So yeah. it sounds like the message is catching on. Oh, yeah, people. definitely getting around. And, and now we've got to... In, in education, you get to where you get uh, recognition. We're past that. So now we're trying to educate a little there bit more. There we go. Uh, and getting the idea that it's, like I said, not just all bees and butterflies, that Wonderful. there's uh, there's other things out there, and you need to be watchful of that, and gardeners should be at the forefront of this. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, Dyke, you brought another I, I brought what I thought was another unusual plant, mm -hmm. and this is a few different stems I've held here together. Uh, this plant... Uh, uh, it's not native, it's been around for a long time and you, you may need to use it carefully, but it's Sorberia sorbifolia, or Ashley sorberia. Uh, there is a newer cultivar out there called Sim, S-E-M, so that's Sim, Sorberia sorbifolia Sim. Uh, it has more gold foliage and a little bit shorter, but what I like about this plant, um, number one, it's extremely tough. And these white blooms start showing up in July, so even when we've got hot, dry summer, or those dreaded Japanese beetles might come out, they do not touch any part of this plant. And so it's a plant that kicks in in the middle of summer and is still blooming in September. So we're looking at three months of this fuzzy bloom on top of this very exotic foliage. And the other thing that's unique about it, you cut it to the ground. 
Oh. And it's back up at five to six feet. So I'm back on that big theme again. So picture these white blooms that are attacking the... There, there we go. <laughs> so picture these white blooms back up on chest to head high on me on a plant that I cut down in the ground in the spring. It springs by rhizomes, so use it in tough. Um, I mean, it chokes out everything. No weeds. Now, don't mix this with other dainty plants because it will <laughs> run over the top of them. It's kept in check by my lawnmower, but I have a patch that's 15 feet across, probably pushing 20 years old now. And again, we go in and mow it off. It is so thick, we don't even mulch it anymore. So is this going to spread or does it grow tall or both? What well, can people if you, expect? If you let it, if you didn't cut it down each year, it does have, I mean, it does have that maintenance to it. Cause if you don't cut it down, it will get really tall, but then have four feet of bare stems. Ah. So the blooms are always up on the top. Gotcha. And what I kind of do to play in the very back of the, my patch is I leave six to eight stems waist high and those blooms are eight inches higher than all oh. the others. So I get a two tier yeah. effect. Yeah. But it, so if you don't cut it down the plant and, and, it needs to be kept in control by the lawnmower. I mean, that stops it from the patch getting bigger. So, yes, you can't take this and just throw it in the middle of, of other plants. It'll, <laughs> just it'll it run go. over. But, again, I keep thinking of somebody that has a big old farm yard or a big house, and they mm -hmm. come in. And, again, I'm stuck on that theme tonight. But you get little 18-inch plants, and it takes a lot of them. Sure. Let's get a plant that's going to spread four or five feet fast, cut it to the ground. I mean, no mulch, no mess, no... No fuss. I kind of no like fuss. it. Nice. Um, and I don't need, you don't need a whole yard of it, and every yard can't use it. But Does this prefer uh, what type of lighting? I've got mine in full sun. Yeah. It has been for years. Okay. The, the yellow variegated needs a little more babying. It's a little dwarf. It needs a little more uh, part shade to keep from burning. I've had this in full sun for 20 years in my yard. Wow, and it's still thriving, yeah. still yeah. going strong. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And uh, Rusty's got a... Uh, block. Round three. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just do a quick teaser here. Um, in, in, a, in a little bit, I'm going to be uh, 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 recording a, a podcast with Mid-American Gardener oh, wonderful. On, on common uh, landscape mistakes. Oh. And this is one of them that sort of a, it was a good idea and it's gone, it's, it's kind of <laughs> gotten out of bounds, shall we say, in my opinion. Um, so typical landscape block, uh, it's something you pick up at a lot of the big box stores and it has a kind of lip on the back. And it's, it's a wall stone, right? Mm -hmm. It's a four inch wall stone. And you know, it's, uh, I see people using these as, as edging, um, which is fine, um, but they usually leave the edging so that there's, there's, they're pretty proud of this block because they just went out and did a lot of work and they want to see it. So now you've got a string trim up against this face that's sort of, that's, uh, it's a, called a split face. And so what's going to happen is you're going to get little bits of rock thrown back at you when you're doing that. So then they, you do that once or twice and you figure out, well, I'm just going to spray a little burn strip. So now you've got a block that's supposed to keep your grass here and your bed here. And you've got to, now you've got to maintain it by spraying it. Otherwise, you get rock thrown at you all the time when you, when you line trim. Um, so that's, that's one thing. Bury it. Make it so that it's only about an inch above ground. And then you can run your mower right over the edge of it. You don't see as much of it, but it does then provide the original intent, which mm -hmm. is the edging between your bed and your turf. Another thing people like to do with these um, is um, stack them up around trees. Well, this is, this is wrong in a lot of different reasons. Uh, for one, you're, you're talking about creating a little ring around a tree that has roots that are going out. And so eventually the roots are going to come up and it's going to put, they're, they're going to buckle. Even if you put a four inch base underneath it and do everything properly, you eventually you're going to get some buckling. So then you've got this small tight ring with, it's kind of doing the wave, <laughs> 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 yes. uh, which doesn't look good. Then on the inside, because you have two or three layers of these, well, of course you've got to fill it in with some, some annuals. So you pack all the soil in around the tree. And what happens is that creates a really, really bad environment for the stem on that tree. Mm -hmm. You've got moisture in constant contact with the bark. Um, it can cause all kinds of problems. It can cause uh, new roots come up and, and girdling roots. Uh, new roots will come up and actually just wrap themselves around mm -hmm. the trunk, which will kill the tree. Um, so great idea, gone awry, because uh, you just killed your tree. Um, there are also insects and diseases that can uh, come in and, and it just creates a favorable environment for that. In general, just kind of think about what you're doing. These can be really attractive, um, or they can also be a big problem. So just uh, be smart about your application. Okay. I guess that's that's the message. That's, that's the that's message. That's the takeaway. Okay. Yeah. All right, Phil. We've got a couple minutes left, so we'll end with you. But you got to be quick. Okay. Valen Hale uh, uh, sent an email in, said I noticed an enormous amount of gray moss in my yard. So I mowed today, thousands of them. Any idea why? Well, it's kind of like 
can you tell me from a half a continent away what this bug is that's biting me on the neck? Uh, you know, it's it's really hard. We have a variety of things. The one on the screen right now is the most common one that's sawed webworm. This is elegant grass veneer. It's a really tiny little guy. It's only about a quarter of an inch long. and one's about an inch. This is a common pug. It's about a half an inch long, and it feeds on a lot of different types of trees and shrubs and other sorts of things. Uh, the, we have lots of uh, green clover worms that are still around. It's about an inch long. It's going to be feeding on legumes such as clover and soybeans and so on. And finally, kind of a neat one at the end is a chickweed geometer. It's a, uh, it's a yellowish moth with some, with some reddish on it, and it feeds on chickweed. It feeds on knotweed, it feeds on smartweed, uh, feeds on lots of things that you really don't want to have. All of these are very common in the yard, and the point is, a lot of them being around, it's just there, it's part of nature, mm -hmm. don't worry about it. So something there they like. They're yes, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> either, either it's close to it and they're kind of hanging out there uh -huh. for R&R, &R, or, or else they grew up there and they're living there, and, and either way about it. Uh, they're not necessarily an indication that you've got a serious problem. What you need to keep your eye on is how nice the grass looks and how well it's growing. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you guys all for coming today and sharing your expertise and knowledge with us. And thank you so much for sending in your questions. And find us on social media, Instagram, Facebook, and make sure you check out that podcast. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Good night.